What? What? Screw it. Whoa, what in the world? <gasps> where... Where the hell am I? Hello? Is there anyone else here? There's... There's nobody here. I'm... I'm all alone. I'm... All alone in here. <laughs> wait, wait a second. I, I think I finally get it. I think I finally know what Evangelion is about. I know what Evangelion is about. <laughs> Neon Genesis Evangelion is a 26-episode Japanese animated series, created and released by Gainax in October of 1995. And really ever since, it's been one of the most widely discussed anime series of all time. But what is it actually about? Well, generally speaking, it's about a 14-year-old boy named Shinji Ikari, who pilots a giant robot called an Evangelion, or Eva for short. Over the course of the series, Shinji and two other teenage pilots, Rei and Asuka, use their Evas to fight equally giant alien creatures known as angels, in an effort to prevent something called Third Impact, which would essentially lead to the end of the world. But if you've already seen the series, then you already know that doesn't really do the show justice. In reality, Ava is a lot of things to a lot of different people. Ask 10 different anime fans what they think the true meaning of Evangelion is, and you're likely to get 10 different answers. To some, Ava is a contemplative meditation on what it's like to live day to day struggling with depression and isolation. To others, due to the show's frequent use of Judeo-Christian iconography, in addition to numerous allusions to Freudian psychoanalysis, it's thought of as a complex tapestry that has something deeper to say about organized religion or broader human interaction. For those who take a more literalist approach to the story's plot, they see Ava as a postmodern masterpiece, culminating in an utterly captivating surrealist depiction of the apocalypse. Some view it as a subversive work of genre fiction, while others see it as a fascinating metatextual story about a creator at war with his audience. Depending on your perspective, Evangelion can be a story about abusive fathers, sexual identity, or maybe as some critics think, it's nothing more than animated garbage that repeatedly objectifies and commodifies its female characters, and whose ponderous musings and convoluted lore don't ever add up to much of anything at all. But in the more than two decades since its release, the intricate story that is Evangelion has only gotten more tangled. For starters, the production of the television series has, over time, developed a canonized backstory of its own, as the creators ran into significant roadblocks throughout the show's original run. While it's often debated, even to this day, as to how much of the series' strain development can be blamed solely on financial issues, there were still plenty of other problems to deal with besides the usual budget cuts animated shows often have to deal with. For one, during pre-production, an entire episode had to be scrapped because of similarities it had to the recent sarin gas attacks on the Tokyo subway system. This, coupled with the creator of the show succumbing to a serious battle with depression, eventually led to the show changing course quite drastically around the midway point of the series, and throwing out all the future scripts that had been written up to that point. As you may already know, working in animation can be a highly stressful undertaking, even if you do meticulously pre-plan and outline everything. But now, with basically all their roadmaps getting thrown out the window, the team at Gainax had to try and put a show together essentially without any safety nets. Each episode was getting written, animated, and finalized up to the very last minute, and all these setbacks eventually led to the finale of Evangelion, episodes 25 and 26, adopting what I'll politely call a more controversial style. Although Ava had never been a show simply about robots fighting monsters, the final two episodes of the series suddenly became much more interested in the battles going on within the characters' heads as opposed to the battles between the Avas and angels themselves. Now employing an abstract cascade of disjointed and dreamlike imagery, the show attempted to visually present the interiority of its characters as they struggled to both reclaim their own sense of identity and discover their place within society as a whole. It was certainly an unconventional approach to concluding a series, but one that ultimately ended on a rather touching sense of hope and empathy for the characters. 
But for the many fans who'd become so enraptured with the show's kinetic action scenes and dangling plot threads, this was not the type of ending they were looking for at all. Now, in most cases, a disappointing end to a story is just something fans have to learn to deal with. You can either compartmentalize it and try and appreciate everything you loved up until that point, or you can let the ending ruin your experience as a whole and just write off the show altogether. But on this one rare occasion, Evangelion fans actually got what they wanted, and the ending was eventually changed. A little over a year after the series' completion, the film The End of Evangelion was released in Japanese theaters, and essentially rewrote the events of the last two episodes of the anime right down to even inserting title card breaks with new names for both episodes. In contrast to the finale of the television show, which had focused primarily on the characters' inner lives, End of Ava stuck more closely to the traditional style from the first 24 episodes of the series. There were now climactic action scenes and some truly breathtaking sequences of animation, which was of course aided by the film's much higher budget relative to the original anime. But one of the biggest changes for the new theatrical revision was the brand new ending that came along with it. Now, instead of the more optimistic tone the show had chosen to go out on, End of Ava went with a much bleaker, almost nihilistic approach, which left fans with now two vastly different interpretations of how the story concluded. The End of Evangelion is, to some, a deeply cynical movie, where ultimately, even the good parts feel like they only exist to be taken away from the viewer. And so, basically ever since its release, it's been highly debatable as to whether or not this was actually a better ending for Evangelion overall. Not to mention the fact that it also meant from this point forward, it was always going to be debatable as to what the true timeline for Evangelion even was. And if we're talking solely about complications surrounding this franchise's fractured continuity, it's important to note, it actually only gets worse from this point forward. Almost a decade after the end of Evangelion debuted in theaters, a new run of four feature-length films known as The Rebuild of Evangelion began production. The initial pitch for this planned series was that, thanks to advancements in both 2D and 3D animation technology, it would allow the creators to retell the story of the original Neon Genesis Evangelion the way it was always meant to be told. This new and improved version of Ava started off as a mostly faithful adaptation of the series, with only a few minor, but in retrospect, potentially significant changes being made. In fact, the first 20 minutes or so of Evangelion 1.0 was almost a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the first episode of the series. But as these films went along, they started venturing further and further off script. The first movie by itself covered, roughly speaking, only the first six episodes of the television show. But by the end of the second movie, this new rebuild adaptation had mostly burned through all of the original source material, and it culminated in yet another altered ending which allowed the third film to tell its own original story entirely, essentially creating now a third continuity for the fandom to agonize over. On top of this, it's probably worth mentioning each of these films have all had their own delays and development troubles as well, which seemingly have only gotten worse with each successive release. In fact, the final film in the series, which was originally slated to debut in 2015, has still yet to be completed, although it has recently been announced that finally, after more than four years of delays, the film is supposed to hit theaters sometime next year in 2020. As for me personally, I'll believe it when I see it. Now, for Western anime fans, Evangelion has sort of floated in this nebulous space between cult classic, but also required viewing for any burgeoning anime fan. This is mostly because, until very recently with its release on Netflix, the show has never been what I would call easily accessible. There have been multiple official releases of the series on DVD since the year 2000, but almost all of them started off at a fairly high price point and only got more expensive as time went on and each release went out of print. Evangelion was not something you were just going to stumble across, it was something you had to actively seek out, something you had to put real effort into finding. But despite these hurdles, Neon Genesis Evangelion has remained relevant to English-speaking anime fans for nearly 20 years now, and that is due in no small part to the show's colossal popularity back in Japan. It really is hard to overstate just how big of a cultural landmark Ava has become in its home country, which has resulted in many other adaptations being created that only seem to have muddied the waters of the official canon even further. Debuting 10 months prior to even the first episode airing on television, a manga adaptation of Evangelion was released and by its completion in 2014, there had been some pretty pivotal changes made from the show's version of the story. On top of that, there have also been numerous spin-off video games and light novels, with some of these even proving instrumental in decoding parts of Evangelion's more complicated lore and backstories. And of course, we certainly can't forget to mention the many and often very totally contradictory crossovers and marketing tie-ins that depict everything from the cast enjoying the silky smooth shave of a brand new Schick razor, to a horse-shaped Ava Unit 1 in a commercial sponsored by the Japanese Racing Association? Look, I didn't come up with this stuff, okay? I just found it on the internet. As it turns out, for better or for worse, the world of Evangelion is immense and doesn't offer many straightforward answers when we're trying to answer the question, 
what is Evangelion actually about? It just seems like one of those questions where people have a lot of theories and assumptions, but very few definitive answers. And trust me, I should know. Ever since I got stuck in here, I've had nothing to do except scrutinize over every crackpot theory and lore explainer known to mankind. And let me tell you, I'm getting real tired at looking at just opinions and guesses by now. The whole reason I got sucked into this void in the first place was because I just wanted a simple answer to what I thought was a fairly simple question. Is that really so much to ask for? And look, I've seen plenty of these hippy-dippy moral relevists out there saying, there is no one true answer to what Evangelion is really about. You just have to look inside and figure out what Evangelion means to you, man. <laughs> what a joke. I mean, I've looked over dozens of forum threads and wiki articles looking for that one definitive answer to my question. And you know what? There are tons of them that just outright contradict one another. So by definition, that means some of them have to be right and some of them have to be wrong. If Ava really is supposed to be this seminal work, if it truly is one of the greatest anime series of all time, then there must be something, some defining truth behind it all, some objective meaning to it. And that, that is what I spent the last four weeks trapped alone in this white, empty void trying to find out. And let me tell you, I found it. It took a long, long time, but baby, I found it. And that's what I'm here to tell you today. I don't want to just keep this information to myself. I need to tell as many people as possible. I need to tell the whole world. So I'm going to spend the next, let's say, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Oh, okay, look, it's going to take a little while. But I promise you, by the end of this video, you're finally going to get all those definitive answers we've been looking so hard for. We're going to do it together, you and me. We're finally going to figure out what Evangelion is objectively about. So I think a logical place for us to begin is to try and establish some more background information about the broader mecha genre of which Evangelion belongs to. And from there we can start to test our first theory and one of the more prevalent reasons I see Ava recommended to people who are already fans of anime in general. That being this idea that Neon Genesis Evangelion is supposed to be some subversive work or critique of the mecha genre as a whole. Now, all this being said, mecha is a hugely varied landscape that has roots going back to at least the 1960s. So I'm going to try and limit the scope of our discussion to elements that just pertain to our examination of Evangelion itself. While you could of course track the genre's influence back even further, the show that is widely considered to be the first mecha anime as we know it debuted in 1963 as Tetsujin 28 Go, or as it was later known in the West, Gigantor. By most accounts, this was the first show to establish the trope of a young boy controlling a giant fighting robot that was created by his scientist father. But if Gigantor is considered the show that established mecha, then the series that would go on to ultimately canonize it was Mazinger Z almost a decade later in 1972. Picking up where Gigantor had left off, Mazinger Z was the first instance of a show's protagonist actually piloting their machine from within the robot, one of the now core tenets of what we consider mecha today. Because of the show's rapidly growing popularity, Mazinger Z inspired the creation of dozens of other mecha shows in a similar vein, essentially establishing their own subgenre of mecha, which would become known as Super Robots. The Super Robot boom consumed most of the 1970s in Japan, and shared a lot of similarities with popular kids' cartoons in America around that same time. These shows were usually aimed at a younger audience, and commonly depicted our heroes piloting their building-sized fighting robots to combat various aliens, monsters, and other fantastical creatures. These were often simple stories where the good guys were good, the bad guys were bad, and everything got wrapped up nice and neatly by the end of each episode. And it's also worth mentioning, these shows were a great way for toy companies to sell lots and lots of merchandise to kids, one of the biggest reasons for the genre's prevalence throughout that decade. But the super robot genre's dominance over mecha started to wane at the tail end of the 70s, with the debut of another highly influential series, the original Mobile Suit Gundam in 1979. And due to that show's own massive popularity, Gundam would eventually usher in a second major subgenre of mecha. Considered the starting point of the real robot genre, Gundam stood out from its super robot predecessors in some pretty meaningful ways. No longer were these giant machines portrayed as heroic symbols of justice, instead they were now depicted as powerful and occasionally even terrifying weapons of war. Gone were the childish stories about humans versus monsters, as Gundam was now much more interested in dealing with the conflicts of humans fighting other humans. And while there was still definitely one side the audience was meant to root for, we also spent a significant chunk of time getting to know the enemy forces and understanding their perspectives as well. The show went out of its way to emphasize the cost of war, not just for the innocents on the margins of the fighting, but also for the participants within it. I see, so this is 
This is what war is. Now, this isn't to say Gundam abandoned every aspect from the super robot genre either. But just like in Gigantor, the show's hero, Amaro Rei, pilots the titular Gundam, which also just so happens to have been developed by his science's father. On top of that, especially in the early going, the show stuck heavily to a familiar episodic format, with Amaro and the white base crew engaged in a new conflict with Shar and the Xeon forces each episode. And don't be fooled by the name. Just because Gundam is labeled as a real robot show, doesn't mean it refrained from utilizing more fantastical elements as well. In fact, by the end of the first series, Amuro is revealed to be what the show refers to as a new type, which basically means he's a space psychic who has preternatural skills at piloting mobile suits. I think an important thing to remember about Gundam that maybe doesn't get brought up enough is that it was very much a series trying to figure out what kind of show it wanted to be as it went along. After all, Gundam is a franchise that has been around for 40 years now, but a lot of the things we consider central foundations of the series today weren't exactly written in stone when the show first began. But the one fundamental element that Gundam really did nail from the very first episode, and the thing that set it apart from all the other super robot shows that came before it, was that now, it didn't seem so fun to pilot a giant robot anymore. And this is where we finally get to wrap back around and start talking about Neon Genesis Evangelion again. When it was first released in the fall of 1995, no one had ever really seen a show quite like Evangelion before. But by now, Ava has kind of been enshrined by many anime fans as this subversive deconstruction of the entire mecha genre. But if that is true, the obvious next question we need to ask is, what kind of mecha is Ava actually subverting? Well, to answer that question, I suppose an important distinction we need to try and establish now that we've gone over the difference between super robots and real robots is, where exactly does Evangelion fall on this continuum? Well, the answer is, unhelpfully, somewhere in between. As with Gundam, the Ava units are absolutely meant to be seen as weapons of war that demand a high price both mentally and sometimes even physically from their teenage pilots. But where Ava starts to sharply differ from Gundam is who the main antagonists of the series are. Much like in a super robot show, the angels are depicted as relatively mindless monsters that we don't really know much about aside from the fact that our heroes, for initially unspecified reasons, need to stop them. But this doesn't mean Ava decided to carry over that same low-stakes tone from those super robot shows as well. Now, the fact that we start out knowing very little about what the angels actually want seems much more deliberate and possibly even a bit insidious. The angels are very pointedly unknowable, and that's supposed to be kind of unsettling for the audience. While the first couple of angels who appear in the show seem normal enough, at least as far as giant cartoon monsters are concerned, as the show gets further along, the angels become increasingly more bizarre and abstract. They no longer feel like frivolous opponents to be thwarted and thrown away at the end of each episode. Instead, they feel like a part of a much larger, unstoppable force that we can never truly comprehend. And even if you do manage to stop one of them, a new and even more powerful creature is basically guaranteed to come along and take its place, making the angels a pretty effective representation of existential dread. Shinji's battles with the angels each episode is an act of desperation and survival, not a triumphant victory over evil, which tonally puts Ava back much closer to the Gundam side of this dichotomy. And I suppose this is as good a time as any to clarify why I specifically keep saying Gundam and not the wider real robot subgenre. Well, it's for the same reason that I spent a little extra time covering Gundam in particular, because especially within Western audiences, it's the show that I see Ava compared to the most. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say that the way people tend to talk about this comparison sort of warped the way I view these two series in general. For context, I, like many American kids of my generation, saw Gundam for the first time in my preteen years during the early 2000s when it aired on Toonami. And for me, that was really the only time I had seen it. In fact, technically speaking, I never even finished watching all of it, as I fell off somewhere around two-thirds of the way through the series. And as far as Ava is concerned, I was a bit of a latecomer to that series, since I didn't watch it until I was much older and in college. So because of that large gap in time between seeing these two series, and because of the specific way Ava was sold to me as this deep subversion of the mecha genre, which, remember, at the time was a genre I had mostly only experienced through Gundam, I had, without knowing it, started to think of Gundam as a much more light-hearted show. But as I quickly learned a little over a year ago when I rewatched Gundam for the first time, that definitely isn't the case. All the things I had heard Evangelion praise for, how it was this deep subversion of genre, how it was actually concerned with ideas like how mentally damaging it would really be to stick a teenager in a robot and send them off to war, Gundam was already doing that stuff nearly two decades earlier. It's kind of a hard thing to put into words, but the best way I know how to describe the difference between Ava and Gundam is that Gundam takes a story about personal trauma to say something more specifically about war and political conflict. 
Whereas Ava takes a story about war and political conflict to say something much more specifically about personal trauma. Their hearts may be in different places. They may ultimately have different stories they each want to tell. But the truth is, they both do borrow from a lot of the same shared elements. It just so happens that they use those shared elements to get to their own unique and respective places. So I suppose if you want to stick to a very narrow definition of the word, you could still technically consider Evangelion to be a subversion of Mecha, in that it does probably subvert some of the audience's expectations by taking a lot of the genre's hallmarks and using those to create something unique and of its own. But a major issue I have with this theory is how subversive Ava comes off as depends an awful lot on how well-versed that same audience is with Mecha as a whole. Not to mention that, at least as it pertains to our overarching question we're trying to answer here today, I don't think either distinction really gets us any closer to figuring out what Evangelion is really about. Because although Ava certainly does seem aware of the genre it's working in, I still remain unconvinced that actually commenting on that genre is anything Ava really cares about doing. Which, unfortunately, means we're gonna have to keep looking elsewhere for our answers. But you know what? That's okay. Like I said, some of these answers were going to have to be wrong, and let's be honest, the odds of us nailing this on the very first try were pretty low. So let's all just regroup, take a breath, and together we can move on and start tackling the next topic on our list. Alright, another aspect you'll see an awful lot of discussion around if you spend any amount of time looking at fan interpretations of Evangelion Online is people trying their damnedest to link all the uses of Judeo-Christian imagery and terminology into some grand, coherent vision. And well, I just have to be honest and say I've never really found any of these arguments all that compelling. I mean, sure, when we're talking about allusions to Christianity within Evangelion, there certainly are a lot of them, but I've never seen this as adding up to anything more than an aesthetic choice. Now, I suppose it's not impossible that a team made up of presumably entirely Japanese animators and writers, making a show aimed at a presumably entirely Japanese audience, had something more specific they wanted to say about Christianity in general, even though according to this one cursory and undoubtedly highly accurate Google search I did shows that only 1% of Japan's population identify as Christian. You know, I really shouldn't use Google anymore, seeing as that's how I got stuck in here in the first place. All I'll say is, while I am by no means a religious scholar, as someone who did grow up in a Christian household and spent 13 years going to a private Christian school in Oklahoma, which just so happens to be a state whose population is reportedly over 70% Christian, there just isn't really anything about Ava's use of specific religious themes that jumps out to me as anything more than surface level. Honestly, this feels a lot more like a practical choice as opposed to an artistic one. Because, look, when you're writing a science fiction story, it's legitimately hard to come up with fake vocabulary. Vocabulary. Essentially, you really only have two good options here. Option one is to try and make up new jargon that walks that fine line between both sounding natural and yet still a bit foreign to your audience. But the downside of this approach is that if you don't really nail that balance, your made up language is going to come off as sounding silly and ham fisted at best. But the good news is there is still the much easier option too, which is to just, let's say, borrow some pre-constructed terminology from somewhere else. I mean, people do that all the time. It's why just about every spaceship, planet, and sci-fi novel here in America borrows heavily from both Greek and Norse mythology. So if you're a Japanese writer and you're trying to come up with some sort of naming convention that will feel a bit unfamiliar but still elicit that sense of grandeur and austerity, well then hey, borrowing from the good book is a logical first choice. Now, I'm not trying to say these allusions are completely meaningless. Evangelion paints itself as a series about existential crisis, so all these images of crosses and rainbows, every mention of Adam, the Magi, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, when used correctly can conjure up that desired apocalyptic sensation in the viewer. I just find it hard to believe all these references are doing anything other than trying to build a specific tone for the piece. Okay, well, we debunked that interpretation rather quickly. But hey, this is far from the only source of inspiration Evangelion draws from. So let's go over a few more of these and see if we can find something with a bit more substance to it. Another resource Ava pulls heavily from for various terminology is Freudian psychoanalysis, with phrases like the hedgehog's dilemma, oral stage, and separation anxiety all being used as either titles for episodes or tracks on the official OST. In fact, there's even a reading of Evangelion I've seen that proposes Asuka, Shinji, and Rei are in fact actually representations of the id, ego, and superego respectively. And unlike all the biblical allusions we just went over, I would say all these references do have a lot more in common with the characters and story that are actually at the 
center of Evangelion. It's no secret to even a casual viewer of the show that Ava is concerned with things like depression and mental health, mostly because it just comes right out and says as much. Do you know the fable, The Hedgehog's Dilemma? A hedgehog? You, you mean those animals with the spiny hair? Even though a hedgehog may want to become close with another hedgehog, the closer they get, the more they injure each other with their spines. <sighs> it's the same with some humans. While the fights against the angels are certainly a prominent aspect of the series, they may not be the primary source of conflict Evangelion is actually concerned with. After all, the show spends just as much screen time, if not more, devoted to Shinji struggling with the question of why he's actually fighting the angels in the first place. Our enemies are something called angels. They have the names of the angels too. They are the targets of Eva and Nerve. This is our revenge for the death of Misato's father. But why do I fight? Why do I do this despite all the pain and suffering? As well as more basic human concerns like trying to figure out how to connect to people without getting hurt. He's just going to have to learn someday <sighs> that part of growing up means finding a way to interact with others while distancing pain. And he is far from the only character in the show stuck waging this sort of cognitive battle on multiple fronts. Asuka, for example, has all of her pride stored up in her ability to be an excellent Ava pilot, and thus has a hard time feeling good about herself without also comparing herself to others. Oh, it's not just that I lost, it's that he beat us so easily. He beat us so easily that it's really pissing me off. Oh. Misato, on the other hand, is trying to be the right kind of guardian for Shinji, but struggles with the fact that while she is able to relate to him in some deeply personal ways, she also finds it difficult to make a genuine connection with him when he needs it the most. Shinji, I don't know what to do or say. All I can do is be here for you. Don't touch me! And Rei, well, Rei is stuck contemplating some of the most fundamental questions about human existence. Who am I? What am I? And why am I even here? Who is this? This is me. Who am I? What am I? What am I? What am I? What am I? I am I. But an important distinction to make here about all this Freudian stuff, all the terminology, even a lot of the theory, much like all the religious allegory from earlier, this all feels just a bit insubstantial. Sure, there's plenty of narrative energy spent on the conflict of parents and children, as well as a lot of visual imagery symbolizing maternal elements such as the womb or rebirth, but all of this just feels more like a passing interest as opposed to the core of what the series is actually concerned with. The parts of Evangelion that feel like they have some actual weight behind them come off as being derived from profoundly personal experiences, and not academic ponderings or theoretical curiosity. I'm sure if you stare long enough, if you really poke and prod at it, you can convince yourself there is a reading of Evangelion that integrates all these Freudian concepts, or even all the religious imagery, into some wider narrative vision. Like, I agree, the pieces are all there for you if you're really willing to put in a tremendous amount of legwork, but for me, I just find it hard to accept something that takes that much work as a satisfying answer for what Evangelion is ultimately trying to say. Remember, we're not trying to list out every ancillary reference or inspiration. We're trying to deduce what is at the very core of Evangelion. And well, all these theories, they just don't feel like it, you know? And speaking of things you really have to squint at to turn them into something coherent, the last thing we're going to talk about is actually going to take us back to our conversation about subversion from earlier. The reason I'm bringing this up now is because this supposed subversion that Ava is trying to pull off isn't about undercutting Mecha, but anime as a whole. And also it just kind of fits better here anyway. But first, for any of you who aren't well versed in anime culture, there is unfortunately something I need to make sure we both understand before we proceed any further. So when I say the word fan service, I'm sure a lot of you already have a definition for the term that comes to mind. While that word can have a pretty broad meaning as it pertains to entertainment in general, when we're talking about anime exclusively, it means something a bit more specific. Hey, watch where you're touching! I can't, I can't help, help it. it! Why do all boys have to be such a bunch of perverted jerks? But what pervert designed this suit? Yeah, I think you get the idea. Anime, just like basically every other form of art made under capitalism, has been no exception to the marketing philosophy of sex sells. And although fan service hasn't always been this prevalent within the medium, it's also hard to ignore just how prominent this aspect of anime culture has become over time. With so many shows gaining popularity, especially those aimed at a specifically male audience, merchandising companies had to learn to evolve with the times. And thus, many shows started to combine the usual shots of giant robots and frantic fight scenes with leering gazes at the female anatomy. And this change in focus, well, 
it paid off like big time. As it turns out, a lot of those young boys watching Mazinger's D and Gundam in the 70s grew up. And as that happened, they went from begging their parents for model kits or action figures of the cool new robots they saw on TV to spending a lot of their own money on figurines of their uh, favorite animated female characters. Look, I'm just, I'm not going to say the word, all right? I simply refuse. And by the fall of 1995, when Evangelion finally made its debut, fan service was already a well-established trope within the medium. And maybe, depending on who you asked, it had something more critical it wanted to say about that as well. Now, I think it's pretty undebatable that there are fan service shots used in Evangelion. Well, I mean, it's the internet, so of course there's always going to be someone willing to debate you on basically anything. But more to my point, the real argument to be had here is how self-aware these fan service shots actually are. And just for the record, before you hit send on that angry comment, I am of the belief that there are uses of fan service within Evangelion that are meant to be subversive. For a good example of this, let's take a closer look at the scene where Shinji first goes over to Rei's apartment. And just so you know, I am going to try and cut around this scene to keep it as safe for work as possible, but, you know, there's only so much I can do here. Basically, you've been warned. So, fast forwarding through a lot of context we just don't have time for right now, Shinji finds himself in Rei's apartment for the first time, and in a wacky case of sexual clumsiness, he winds up inadvertently falling on a naked Rei, which results in Shinji accidentally grabbing her breast as a shower of pristinely white undergarments rains down upon them. Now, once again, for anyone not familiar with anime tropes, this is actually a pretty commonly used scenario. A male character ends up accidentally groping or just doing something sexually inappropriate to a female character. In response, said female character ends up angrily slapping him, and the sexual tension meter between the two of them goes up by one notch. In fact, Ava itself does this multiple times with Asuka only a few episodes after this Shinji and Rei scene. But what makes this particular scene we're looking at so different is Rei's reaction to the encounter. While Shinji is, to his credit, appropriately embarrassed and nervously trying to apologize, Rei staying true to her character up to this point appears to be pretty indifferent to the whole situation. As Shinji continues to stammer away and can't even bring himself to make eye contact with her, she simply goes about her routine getting dressed and eventually just leaves the room altogether without saying anything at all. It isn't until the following scene where we get the usual comeuppance, with Rei eventually slapping Shinji, although it isn't for the usual reasons. Instead of hitting Shinji for inappropriately touching her, she slaps him because of how flippantly dismissive he is of his father Gendo, someone who Rei is utterly devoted to and thus finds Shinji's disrespect for him worthy of punishment. Now, I still think it's up for debate as to how critical this scene actually is about the use of fan service in anime writ large, but I do definitely agree that this trope is being subversively employed here. It's taken the usual payoff for this kind of scene, the slap and the rising sexual tension, and undercuts it by making the scene awkward instead of titillating. And once we do get the delayed payoff, it is connected not to any sort of sexual tension between the two characters, but instead to their different perspectives on Gendo the primary source of conflict between these two characters up to this point in the show. So I do think this is a pretty effective, self-aware, and yes, even subversive use of this particular trope. But I don't necessarily agree that this series has anything more explicitly critical it wants to say about fan service or the portrayal of women in anime in general. In fact, this show's depiction of women is often at best inconsistent and at worst pretty much indefensible. My primary reason for saying this is, well, the fact that the series does still happily use dozens of other traditional fan service shots throughout. In addition to the fact that in the later episodes when the show really wants to dive more into the characters' psyches, well, let's just say all that inspiration from Freud wasn't great for the show's opinion of women. Plus, I mean, the rebuild movies basically drop any notion of this kind of subversion entirely in favor of pretty much exclusively uncritical fan service shots. And look, if you're someone that wants to argue with me about how it's actually totally cool that the show wants to objectify 14-year-old girls, or that my puritanical western sensibilities just don't understand all the subtlety that's at play here. Well, it's totally been great having you here, thanks for making it this far in the video, but uh, you can go ahead and leave now. And don't forget to like and subscribe, but uh, yeah, that angry comment you were working on earlier, you don't need to bother posting that. So much like when we were talking about the show's potential subversion of genre, I think this is another case where Evangelion is certainly aware of the sandbox it's playing in, and does want to use prior knowledge of how the sandbox works to say something new and original in that space, but doesn't really care to comment one way or the other about the sandbox itself. Which means, as it pertains to fan service, this show is still very much on the hook for the objectification and commodification of its female characters. Which maybe in turn means this seminal work of animation might have a few more flaws in it than we had previously thought. I guess when it comes down to it, while I do appreciate how much time and energy people are willing to dump into decoding Evangelion's deeper meanings, none of these are just really doing it for me. 
when I watch Ava, I get this deep guttural feeling. And all these series that we've looked at so far, they just kind of feel like they're getting lost in the weeds a bit too much. It feels like they're all poking around the core of what Evangelion is, but they're never really nailing it. You know, maybe the problem here is that we're just thinking about all this too academically or abstractly. Maybe it's time to simplify things a bit and take a closer look at just the narrative itself. No more background information, no more symbolism. Let's concentrate on just the facts, the good old fashioned A to B to C, and then we'll see where that gets us. Now, I promise I really do want to get into the nitty gritty of this plot. After all, I didn't spend multiple weeks traipsing through three separate wikis for nothing. But there is something very important that we need to figure out before we do that, which is we need to decide out of these numerous continuities and interpretations, what is the actual timeline to Evangelion's story? Because remember what I said at the beginning of the video, some of these versions are going to be right and some of them are going to be wrong. And I for one do not want to be wasting my time taking a microscope to all the wrong plot points here. Now right off the bat we're obviously not going to consider all of the marketing tie-ins and such. I mean come on, a horse shaped Ava Unit 1? What's next, are going to let actual horses start piloting mechs too? <laughs> Oh, uh, well, never mind then, I guess. Also, and I hate to be the one to say it, but we're taking the slightly altered manga adaptation and throwing it right out the window as well. And I'm sure there's more than a few of you manga fans out there that are a little upset by this, but you know, that's just too bad. Because hey, at the end of the day, the anime is the most popular version of the story, and as we all know, that objectively means it is therefore the most accurate as well. This of course also means we're throwing out all the video game and light novel sequels and spinoffs while we're at it. Look, I don't make the rules, okay? I am just trying to do my best to live within them. But although all these omissions do help better define the scope of our investigation, this alone does not solve all of our problems. Even if we are focusing exclusively on the anime, we still have three separate continuities we have to deal with. Or at least two and a half? Somehow we need to figure out between the TV show, the end of Evangelion, and the rebuild movies, which is the real timeline we need to focus in on. And I know this is all probably starting to sound really complicated, but don't worry, dear viewer, because I have a solution for this problem as well. What if I told you I had devised a way to take these three seemingly disparate narratives and fold them into one cohesive story? What would you say to that? Okay, you're right, I didn't come up with that idea at all. It's actually a fairly popular fan theory online that a surprising amount of the fan base do already agree on. Like I said, I didn't spend four weeks looking at wikis for nothing. So the gist of this theory is that the first 24 episodes of the television series essentially play out like normal. And then once we reach episode 25, where the world is on the brink of third impact and Shinji is in a nearly comatose depressive state, the last two episodes of the series and the film The End of Evangelion are actually happening simultaneously. The original episodes 25 and 26 take place entirely within Shinji's mind as he tries to find a reason to go on existing, and End of Ava shows us what's happening outside of Shinji's head, with the invasion of Nerve and the events that lead up to the eventual third impact. And then, at the culmination of both End of Ava and episode 26, when Shinji decides to reject instrumentality, this essentially resets the world and creates a new version of Earth where the rebuild movies will eventually take place. And so there you have it, that's our first big continuity divide seamlessly stitched back together. But for those of you who remain unconvinced, don't worry, because there's still even more evidence to support this theory in the rebuild movies themselves. As I mentioned earlier, the first two movies of this tetralogy are a pretty faithful adaptation of the original series. But there are a few little hints scattered throughout the film that might suggest this is not just a simple retelling of the story. That is, if you know what you're looking for. The first important alteration is the color of the sea from which the angel Satchel appears from. Unlike the first episode of the TV show, in Evangelion 1.0, the water is already red, just like it was at the close of End of Ava. Now I understand that alone is hardly compelling evidence, but when you connect it to other little gnaws like this red stripe on the moon in the rebuild timeline, that could very easily be linked to the blood spray off the giant Ray lilith hybrid thing from End of Ava, along with the fact that Shinji's tape deck now goes up to track 27, something it never did in the anime, you can start to see these as little winks and nods to the audience, telling us that we've actually now entered uncharted territory. Alright, so now how are you feeling about this little theory of ours? Still unconvinced? Okay, well, how about the fact that in the original show, before the end of Evangelion was even in production, there are multiple shots that line up with events that actually go on to happen in End of Ava, huh? What do you have to say about that? 
And okay, maybe I did just end the last section by saying theories that require the audience to do all the heavy lifting are often unsatisfying, but you know, maybe that's what Evangelion actually is after all. Maybe that is its true nature, to make us hunt and search for answers, to force us to meticulously obsess over every detail. I mean, come on, it's not like they're gonna just spell everything out for us. Otherwise, I wouldn't have to spend all this time making this overly long YouTube video explaining it all, right? Right? <sighs> But you know, now that you mention it, there is something about this whole unified timeline theory that just doesn't sit right with me either. I mean, sure, on paper, you can certainly connect the dots in a way that makes this theory seem plausible, or at the very least in a way that doesn't necessarily disprove it. But when I actually watched those last two episodes of the show and the end of Ava back to back, I can't help but notice these two endings feel tonally incompatible. The ending to episode 26 is so hopeful and life-affirming, but that last scene in the end of Evangelion is just so maliciously cynical to the point that I can't really buy that this Shinji and this Shinji are supposed to be the same person. Sure, in both versions, Shinji makes the same choice to reject instrumentality, for what, without context, seems like similar reasons. But if you take a closer look, you realize that isn't necessarily true. At the end of episode 26, entitled Take Care of Yourself, Shinji rejects instrumentality, which for any of you who haven't actually seen the show, is essentially an event that would effectively break down the barriers between every human being's psyche, and result in all life on Earth sharing one unified consciousness. A world where there is no line defining where one person ends and another begins. A world of complete understanding, but also no individuality. And that is ultimately why Shinji decides to reject this new form for humanity, because he finally finds the will to be his own person. I hate myself, but... But maybe, maybe I could love myself. Maybe my life could have a greater value. That's right. I am no more or less than myself. I am me. I want to be myself. I want to continue existing in this world. My life is worth living here. He doesn't want to let go of his individuality because he has decided if he can learn to love himself, if he can think of himself as someone worthy of being loved, then maybe he can make meaningful connections with other people, with other individuals. And even though opening yourself up to other people also means opening yourself up to potential pain, it's ultimately worth the risk because, in the end, that is a part of what being human is all about. I know I said it earlier, but this ending, it's something that even after multiple viewings, it still has yet to lose its beauty. And then, there's the end of Evangelion. For the sake of clarity, I want to be sure and mention, when I say that this version of Shinji from the end of Evangelion doesn't feel like the same Shinji from the end of the show, I'm not just talking about the often heavily scrutinized final scene of the movie. While Shinji has, of course, always been a more passive individual, the end of Evangelion takes that part of his character to an entirely new level. I mean, throughout most of the film, he literally has to be dragged from one scene to the other. In fact, one of the few things Shinji does do in the movie of his own volition is, well, it's not great. But it's not just the fact that Shinji has become so emotionally shut down that makes the movie so uneasy and sometimes even upsetting to watch. It's the fact that what little emotion he does have left in him is mostly just spitefulness and anger. During the second half of the film, in the parts which much more closely connect to the endings of the TV show because they appear to be taking place almost entirely within his mind, Shinji is constantly lashing out at everyone and anyone around him. Whereas in the finale of the series, Shinji's hatred was almost always focused inward, now his self-hatred is projected outwards, pushing everyone who has ever cared about him away. Until eventually he just sees them as more enemies. And so he decides to end the world. He consciously decides to kill them all. And then, after all this, we make it to the final part, where just like the last episode of the series, Shinji is given the chance to embrace instrumentality. To live in an existence without any pain caused from people misunderstanding one another. A reality that Shinji himself claims he wanted. But in the end, once he is finally given the world he had so greatly desired, Shinji decides to reject that one too. I just felt pain when I existed in that reality. So I thought it was alright to run away. But there was nothing good in the place I escaped to either. Here, Shinji doesn't reject instrumentality because he's gained some greater understanding about himself, because he's realized being able to love himself means being able to connect with other people. He just does it because living in a world without pain didn't bring him any more happiness than living in a world with it. Both versions of this ending could be seen in a certain light as a selfish decision on Shinji's part, but only one of them is portrayed as outright malicious, or at the very least, malicious out of indifference. 
So as we reach that final scene, and Shinji is yet again given the thing he says he wants and the world is restarted, the literal first thing he does once he is given his individuality back is to continue trying to hurt the ones he loves the most. He's gone through so much, through the literal ending of the world, and yet he has come out the other side completely unchanged. Still broken, still defeated, and still unable to do anything besides cause others pain. And depending on where you'd want to draw that particular line in the sand that says this is the conclusion to Evangelion's story, this could possibly be the last note the saga goes out on for you. So with that in mind, I can't really blame anyone for wanting to try and make sense of this all, to find some redeeming value in either of these endings. But this whole unification theory, it's yet another interpretation that just doesn't work for me. If you ask me, these endings sit most comfortably together as parallel options, two possible versions of who Shinji could become based on all the trauma he's gone through. Because as much as I don't like watching this Shinji from the end of Eva, my argument is not that this evolution in his character isn't believable. It's just that the moment between when he says this, but maybe, maybe I could love myself, and when he does this, doesn't really feel like the natural point for him to make this radical change in personality. So my counterpoint isn't that this particular fork in Shinji's character arc couldn't exist, I just think we need to move it back a bit. By the end of episode 24, before the split in the original continuity, Shinji has nearly been killed on multiple occasions, been reduced down to a quantum state with his consciousness free-floating in a pool of primordial liquid, had his father essentially take over his body and nearly kill one of his best friends, and most recently he has just been betrayed and forced to kill the only person in his life he claims to have ever showed him true unconditional love. I'm saying I love you. So yeah, I'd say by this point Shinji's mental state is probably on some pretty shaky ground. And from here I would say this is where Shinji's story branches off into two potential paths. One path where he chooses hope, and another path where he chooses despair. So really, I guess the answer to what is the true ending to Evangelion, or at the very least what is the true bridge into the Reveal movies, is both of them. Or neither of them? Wait, this wasn't how this was supposed to work. This whole unification theory was supposed to clarify things. It was the linchpin that held everything together. But if anything, it's only made things worse. Oh, this is starting to make my head hurt. Maybe... Maybe I have been looking in the wrong places all along. Instead of looking to all these outside sources to just tell me what Evangelion is about, maybe I really should have just been looking inside myself. Nah, that can't be it. I think it's time for me to just admit to my own hubris here. I wanted so desperately to be able to find these answers on my own, to separate the right from the wrong, to grasp that truth with my own two hands. I think I just need to pull the ripcord on this one and go straight to the source to find the answers I've been looking for. Maybe then I'll finally get some definitive answers about what Evangelion is objectively about. The man you're looking at here is Hideaki Hano, the writer, director, and creator of Neon Genesis Evangelion. And boy, let me tell you, it has been really hard to make it this far into the video without bringing this dude's name up once. The reason for that is, much like the story of the original Evangelion's troubled production, Anno's own relationship to his creation has become something of folklore to his many fans by now. If you know anything about Evangelion outside of the literal text itself, you probably know about Anno's personal struggle with depression. It's something that seriously hampered his work in the years leading up to Evangelion, and was a primary source of inspiration during the show's production. Over the years, fans have spent a lot of time trying to use Evangelion as a means to get a better look inside its creator's head, and in fact, this also plays a key role in another interpretation of the end of Evangelion we haven't gone over yet. One of the many theories that tries to explain why End of Eva doesn't line up so neatly with the rest of the series is that it isn't really supposed to, and the film is instead Anno's last act of revenge against the fans who hated his original ending to the TV show so much. The primary source for this hypothesis comes during the disconnected live-action sequence of the film, where we see shots of actual angry death threats that were sent to Anno, as well as photos showing the defacing of Gainax's studio entrance with graffiti, essentially bringing the world outside of the movie directly into the text itself. According to this theory, the reason Shinji is so passive and unlikable in the film is supposedly Anno's final jab at the audience, since Shinji is naturally supposed to be their audience surrogate. And the new ending basically serves as a giant middle finger, as if to say, you wanted a new ending, right? Well, here you go. I hope you're happy with it, but of course you won't be because you're never really happy with anything, are you? Now personally, I don't know how much I buy this theory either, but at the very least it certainly is a testament as to just how much Anno's shadow looms large over the world of Evangelion. 
Outside of Hayao Miyazaki, I don't know if there's another anime director whose own personal story has become so intertwined with the stories they've created themselves. And Anno appears to have a rather uneasy relationship to this fact. He's not one to give many interviews, and he will almost always sidestep the question when directly asked about the meaning behind his most popular creation. In fact, if you've watched any other YouTube videos about him or Evangelion, then you might start to recognize some of the shots you're seeing. That's because I'm using footage from what appears to be one of the only easily accessible long-form video interviews with Anno that exists on the internet. In actuality, it comes from a Japanese television program called Extracurricular Lessons, wherein Anno goes back to the school he attended as a child and serves as a guest teacher to a class of 6th graders. Unfortunately, even though the program runs well over half an hour long, there isn't actually that much discussion pertaining to Evangelion itself. But we still may be able to use this to our advantage. If Anno doesn't want to answer any of our direct questions about Evangelion, well, that's fine. But let me tell you something, buddy. Even after being stuck in here for the last month, even after searching through piles and piles of theories online, my resolve hasn't weakened one bit. So I tell you what, we're going to take a closer look at this little program here, and we're going to use it to figure out just what it is that Mr. Hideaki Anno is trying so very hard to hide from us. After all, I made you a promise at the very beginning of this video that we were going to find the truth we had been looking for, and I damn well plan on keeping that promise, whether Mr. Anno likes it or not. So if we're going to try and use this program to get a better understanding of who Anno is as a creator and as a person, I think the best place to start would be to look at what kinds of lessons he actually gives these kids. Now, before he even arrives for his first day as a substitute teacher, Anno has already given his new class their first assignment, drawing a picture of what they think Anno looks like, accompanied by a short description of what they imagine the animator's personality to be. As a side note, he also remarks that he's a bit nervous about this whole endeavor, because he doesn't have a whole lot of experience dealing with kids on a day-to-day -day basis, which, yeah. Based on his writing and other interviews I've read, Anno not being good around kids is about the least surprising thing you could have told me. But the assignment itself is actually pretty interesting. By asking the students to draw someone they have never met before, he is basically asking them to draw the version of Anno that exists within their heads based solely on their experience with his art. And I mean, that's something we all kind of do, right? Whether consciously or not, all of us make assumptions about the people behind the art we consume. Kind of like I just did a second ago. But as these kids quickly find out, the image they had of Anno in their head can differ quite a lot from the actual person himself. The next project he assigns the class is to create a simple animation involving a circle, with each of the students submitting their drawings to Anno upon completion. And I have to say, Anno is unexpectedly a pretty good teacher here. For someone who doesn't think of themselves as good with kids, he's actually surprisingly adept at giving the students helpful feedback, but also letting them experiment and never telling anyone they're doing it wrong. Once everyone is finished, the drawings are all shot and played together sequentially to create one longer piece of animation. While the finished product certainly won't be winning any awards for excellence in animation, it is genuinely kind of cool to see the kids' collective effort be put together to create a piece of art that kind of represents all of them. After lunch, the class is divided up into multiple groups, each of which go on a separate field trip of sorts to different areas around town in an effort to collect more information about Anno's childhood. One group goes to meet his parents, another interviews some of his friends from high school, while the last group meets one of his old neighbors. Their homework is to take the information they have gathered and create a short animated story about Anno when he was their age. The following day, the students finish their drawings and submit them to be photographed just like the pictures of the circles had been the day prior. And Anno even lets the kids try their hand at recording some voiceovers while they're at it. The end result is a series of often charming but also noticeably different interpretations of what Anno's childhood was like. It's only once they're all connected that the character of adolescent Hideaki Anno starts to become more defined. Now this is, of course, still just a fictional version of Anno, distilled and reinterpreted through the perspectives of those who knew him as a child. In a sense, it's kind of like all those people, and now even the kids in the classroom, have their own unique version of Anno that lives inside their head, based on the time they've now spent with him. But of course, it's still a highly subjective and ultimately incomplete representation of who the real Hideaki Anno is. Wait, haven't I heard this somewhere before? There is the Shinji Akari that exists in your mind. The Shinji Ikari in Misato Katsuragi's mind, the Shinji Ikari in Asuka Soryu's mind, the Shinji Ikari in Rei Ayanami's mind, and the Shinji Ikari in Gendo Ikari's mind. All are different Shinji Ikaris, but each of them is a true Shinji Ikari. Before leaving, Anno gives the class one final piece of advice that is actually pretty darn good. <laughs> Anno 
世の中っていうのはもうそんなマルカペケだけじゃないんで自分自身で考えてそれを言葉なり絵なり表現をするそれが人に他の人にコミュニケーションとして伝わるわけなんですそれをあの大事にしてくださいということで僕の2日間の授業を終わります本当にありがとうございました This didn't go how I planned at all. I give up. I thought if I tried to learn more about the person who actually made Evangelion, then I would finally be able to understand what the damn thing meant in the first place. But now I'm just left wondering if you can ever truly understand another person at all. I mean, I certainly had my own, admittedly, mixed opinions about the guy just based solely off his work, but. Then when I watch this TV show, I think Anno comes off as a pretty decent guy. Sure, maybe a bit introverted and socially awkward at times, but he also seems genuinely thoughtful. But on the other hand, I can turn right around and watch another interview with Anno where he's just casually talking about how Rey and Asuka were specifically designed as polar opposites so they could attract as many different kinds of male viewers as possible. And then I just start thinking he's a creep that I don't want to admire at all. Ugh, this whole investigation was supposed to help me, but now I just feel more lost than ever. All I wanted was to find one simple, objective answer to my question. Was that really so hard? And now I'm just stuck here in this prison without any idea how to get home, and on top of that, I'm not any closer to finding an answer to my question than when I started. <sighs> Wait, wait a second. I, I think I finally get it. I think I finally know what Evangelion is about. I know what Evangelion is about. Trapped in the vast and empty void of cyberspace, Drew has finally found the answers he's been searching so long for. But what does this elusive answer actually entail? And more importantly, will it be enough to help him escape from the mysterious prison he now finds himself in? Tune in next time for the stunning conclusion to our story as our hero finally discovers what Evangelion is subjectively about.